Here we are with Gavin McDermott. He's an investor at IDEO Collab Ventures, the venture arm uh, of IDEO, um, which you know is also the focusing on, on crypto for IDEO. So I'm so excited to have you on the Define podcast. Thank you so much for joining Yeah, thanks, Cammy. It's great to be chatting with you. Yay. All right. So um, I'm really interested to dive into what uh, you're, you're doing with this fair launch capital movement, which, you know, it, it's becoming like, like this um, new, new trend in, in DeFi. And I think it's really exciting because it's taking the, the space where um, to, to, a, to a more healthier place than what, what it's been trending towards. But before we, we get to that, I, I just love to kind of get your background um, and, you know, how you got into crypto in the first place. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, really quick, quick background was a long time ago, I was in finance and I was looking for a way to improve just the general system state. So when Bitcoin happened, it made a lot of sense. I ended up moving to San Francisco in like 2012. Um, it's where I met Mike Belshi and I was the first engineer hire there. So I ended up growing BitGo with Mike and the team. Um, yeah, for a few years, um, then stepped out and then wound up, uh, took a little time and, you know, as Ethereum and things were kind of happening, um, IDEO, it's one of the world's best design firms, let's put it like that. And so after having seen what amazing engineers can do without design, I thought it'd be a great place to go see what the world's best designers could bring into crypto. And so I've been there since, and it's provided really fruitful soil for, uh, for exploring that. Oh, that's interesting that you, you got into it from kind of um, a design perspective. Um, yeah, well, it's like, I love the engineering side of things, mm -hmm. um, but engineering is only part of the equation. And so we've got a whole lot, like, and you understand this well with the way you write and the way you storytell, you need storytelling and narrative and design to be able to bring these kind of abstruse things into the public domain so that more people can use them. And without that, it just kind of winds up this esoteric thing that you just talk about and very few people use. Very interesting. So, um, so from, from when have you been uh, investing in ideal? Yeah, so we started the fund uh, a little over two years ago, um, and we're IDEO's first venture fund in this space, and we started investing just, it was kind of a side effect, like we've always been really hands-on builders, and that's kind of where we all come from, um, and we had this lab where we were really, we'd been, we got really hands-on in the early days, I mean, we, we'd know uh, Demi and the team at Open Zeppelin, before it was Open Zeppelin, back when they were at Streamium, so we were working with them, we had worked on uh, the first version of Augur's interface with Joey and the team and their first team. So like basically throughout the years, we've been working with these really amazing founders and projects. And a lot of the times they'd asked us to write checks and we didn't have any capability of doing that. So the fund was kind of a side effect of all the hands-on work we'd been doing. Cause yeah, we were, we were effectively, that was, that was our, our talent was bringing design into the space. Mm -hmm. And so being able to speak both design and engineering, it was like, well, we've got to, we've got a real ability to get involved early and not just write a check. And that was kind of the thesis behind the fund was let's add a lot more than just money because if capital is a commodity, um, we need to be able to do a lot more. And so, yeah, again, IDEO was, was a really great ground for that. Oh, well, that's interesting. So what IDEO, what, what you do is you, you help out projects with their different um, design decisions. And I, I guess like how, you help them actually build the, the product and also in, invest in, in these projects as well. Yeah, so we're, we're, we've been extremely hands-on. Um, we've been in heavily involved in you know, the economic design side. Um, we did a lot of interesting things with some projects like FutureSwap kind of earlier in the year. Mm -hmm. um, and then on the, pro like the product design and the, and the hands-on brand design, narrative and storytelling like we were talking about, We've got the world's best people involved at IDEO and to bring them to bear with some of the projects that we work on is a lot of fun. And so that's, yeah, that's kind of the, the blend that we have is, um, like I said, I think capital is kind of a commodity. And so we're looking at how do we do more for these teams because we all love the space. And, you know, like we're kind of talking about like fair launch capital and some of the things that we all write and talk and, and believe in, we just need to bring a little bit more than uh, speculation. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Um, and so you, I guess at, at BitGo, you, you started out in kind of the, um, the, the Bitcoin side of things, but like the investments that you've mentioned are, are more on kind of Ethereum. Um, so how, how does that work at IDEO? Is it just like kind of, 
I don't know, a coincidence or chance that you've <laughs> kind of focused on Ethereum or is that kind of uh, a thought out decision? Yeah, a strong belief in both. We're invested in both. And I believe that both are actually extremely, cru they're crucial for, for the way this movement's going. And they both have completely different roles to play. Um, so we're, you know, I, I, I believe in both. So let's mm -hmm. all put it that way. Mm -hmm. um, but we're, you know, where we've tended to go and where we have seen a little bit more fast pace in terms of what we can do and how we can iterate on, on evolving things. Ethereum has been just a little bit more activity there. So that's where we found ourselves um, being a little bit more hands-on to date. Um, and, and, you know, yeah, I'll leave it there. Yeah, no, it makes sense. Um, and I guess, you know, that, that brings us to, to DeFi because obviously that's kind of the sector that's seen so much activity on, on Ethereum recently. Um, and, you know, the sector that kind of compelled you, I guess, to, to create this um, fair launch capital um, mm, idea or like project uh, is a way to describe it. Um, so what, what was happening in DeFi that kind of compelled you to create this? And, and if you can explain what Fairlands Capital is. Yeah. Um, what's been happening in DeFi, I think is just amazing in terms of the quality of people and the quality of ideas. And there's, there's plenty of noise, right? There's, you're always going to find a lot of BS wherever something interesting is happening. So being able to parse that, but underneath when you kind of get down, un, when you kind of get down under the noise, there's a lot of primitives and behaviors and possibility that is starting to emerge that was just, it's almost, it's just, you have to pay attention to it. And it was it, like that, yeah, it's just, it's, it's, it's absurdly interesting. And a lot of the mechanics that are developing are also some of these things where they're, they're enabling behaviors for coordination, new types of collective coordination that we didn't have two years ago. Mm -hmm. And it kind of like, it sparked with honestly, synthetics, the, the, like the incentivized pool on Uniswap and seeing how you could, you could coordinate behaviors to support that underlying protocol in a different domain. And that was like one of the first fire starter moments, but, um, but yeah, so it's like, we've been watching all these mechanisms evolve over the last period of time. And with, with every little step, you wind up with these new possibilities for human coordination. And that's, that's honestly what it is for me. It's like, these are games of human coordination. And so through that lens, um, you can kind of set aside all, a lot of the noise and start understanding what do we really have here? Mm -hmm. And so then, you know, what emerged from that, you know, like when we saw, uh, when Wi-Fi hit the scene, kind of made me pause and, just kind of take a look at what had, at what had happened and what was starting to form in, on the side. And let's just like put, put like a, a pin in that and say that's one like data point on the landscape. Uh, on another data point, you know, I'd been in, in conversations with uh, founders. There was one guy I was talking to in particular and I was asking him like, really, why are you raising money? Like, what are you raising funds for? And, you know, the, the answer was, well, to get an audit and to take care of some of these basic things. And so, you know, we got to talking like, well, if you just had, if there was a place you could go that could take care of that, that first audit and things like that, and would you pursue a launch with similar principles to just, you know, a type of, let's, let's say fair launch in quotes, because we're still learning what that is and what it means and how to do those things. Like the, the economic, the economic tools, the mechanisms, those are still being created, like in the, in the vault that's being written right now. Um, but anyway, so it was like, would you pursue a fair launch if that was the case? And his answer was, well, yeah, that'd be great. There's just nowhere to do that right now. And so that was like the fire starter of, okay, so the bet was this. It's like for every founder that wants to go raise traditional capital, um, there's, there's, I'm guessing a handful of founders that would be interested in pursuing a different model. And that's not saying that like, you know, uh, unequivocally a fair launch or the fair launch dynamics are better than going and raising VC funding or anything like that. I think there's, there's room for both, but it is optionality and it is a new design surface that we have to work with speaking of design. And so as soon as, you know, we ran that by a few founders of like, if we just had this as a potential, what would you do with it? There was a lot of resonance and it's like, if you, I listen to resonance, right. It's, mm -hmm. it's just, it's the nature of things. And when something resonates, there's, there's usually a connection. And there was a lot of connection. Um, so that's how we got to talking with Ruben and Joe about, okay, what do we need to actually make this thing a reality? Um, and yeah, that was, that was the fire starter for it. But that's also the, like, all that was birthed from all the collective 
movement and churning within DeFi and the behaviors that enable like governance and all the behaviors that are starting to emerge. So again, this stuff just wasn't possible 18 months ago based on how communities coalesced at that point in time. But today we have kind of a confluence of factors that makes it possible. So can you go deeper into what those factors are that led to this moment? Yeah. Um, let's start with, let's start with just engaged, engaged community and mm -hmm. quick coordination and decision-making the ability for people to just make decisions on chain and evolve that into a protocol quickly. We, the, the, the speed of that, of that iteration loop just keeps increasing. So like the, the loop keeps getting tighter and tighter. And so we've got a really solid foundation of people who are active governors, I would say at this point in time, more, you know, it's not, it's not giant, but it's, it's larger than it was, you know, by let's say an order of magnitude than it was last year at this point in time. Mm. And so we've got, we've got domains for dialogue on Twitter and other places where pseudonymous, anonymous, or fully named people get involved in public conversations about what decisions are coming up. Um, the number of protocols, so that's the first one. And I think that's been enabled by kind of the second piece, which is just the number of protocols which require public coordination and decision-making mm -hmm. are also just, they've been exploding, right? I, I wrote about this a little bit in the early part, but like in the early part of the year, but um, some of the teams we've been working with, you know, when you had future swap and compound, those were like kind of the first, like on the scene governance uh, tokens, just like pure governance. And then you just watched it just, and that you had balancer on heels. You just, it just like kind of went nuts. And so it's almost been kind of, um, it's like been mandated by the, the number of protocols that are requiring governance has put this, you know, this unstated mandate out that we need public governance or we need governance. And so those two things have kind of created the conditions of, you know, for better or worse, where we are right now. And so, yeah, it's, those are like two driving factors, even though like, you know, there's a whole lot of things behind that too, in terms of, you know, the engineering and things like that. Makes sense. Um, so what about kind of these two factors, an engaged community and just the number of protocols requiring uh, organization and, and governance, do you think leads to this sentiment that there, there, there needs to be more um, projects that aren't uh, backed by by VC funding and, and that are kind of community owned and, and community led, because I, I think that's kind of such an interesting um, change in, in DeFi. Uh, I guess, you know, like last year, um, like the, the, um, the, the, the best projects were considered the ones who ha hadn't issued any tokens and the, were funded by, by traditional like funding mechanisms as kind of a reaction to ICOs. But that's mm -hmm. kind of like changed that 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 narrative. Um, wh where do you think that that's coming from? That's a good question. Um, let's put it this way: I think there's seasonality with everything, mm -hmm. and in crypto, everything has has a season. And so, you know, I'm not saying that. You know, I'll, I'll, actually, I'll just I'll leave it with that. So, things kind of things tend things tend to have, they blow in. It's like mm -hmm. the, the ICO had a season, then there was a, there was a push against that. However, it's like, if we get out of the mentality of seasonality and we just think about what are options, I'm all for optionality. Mm -hmm. And Alan Kay had a really nice saying though, but he talked about a pencil being high technology because an infant could pick it up and, you know, just like scribble, but, but anybody can use that to express themselves. And so that has a, that has a, I really believe in the idea of reducing, reducing the barriers between a person and their expression. And so in order to get something into the world, that's all we're talking about in terms of shipping a thing. Mm -hmm. And so if that requires capital and you have to go you know, through an ICO or, or a traditional raise, those are the mechanisms you had. And all we're talking about with Fair Launch is another way of enabling founders to express themselves. And so for me, it's all about, you know, it's, it's about optionality and giving founders and creators new options of expression so that, that they can be a little bit less constrained in what their possible and potential paths are. Because when you, a lot of times what you want to do doesn't necessarily follow the rules. 
or the rails that have been set. And so very, it's not very often that we get new potentials that, that allow an entire generation of people to do some, to do the thing that they wanted to do in a new way. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the neat things about our domain is that crypto tends to play in that space just on a very natural basis. And a lot of new things keep emerging from it that are fundamentally uh, new. Mm -hmm. And that's just, that's it. So all these things have their seasons, but also I don't think every one of these things is a fad. I think there are sometimes, and very occasionally we get these markers on the landscape of, of what crypto is that are just like a beacon of how things will likely be. And so, yeah, that's, that's, that's it. Interesting. Okay. So do you think um, this way of raising capital can be, you know, just a, a, a new way going forward in, in general of, of fundraising? I absolutely. Yeah, I do. And I, so, like I said earlier, I don't think it's, um, I don't think it's a replacement for venture capital. Like you, you always need, you'll always need good people around the table, but, and maybe it's not right for, here's the thing. It's like, we're still in the fair launch was like Wi-Fi happened a few months ago. Fair launch capital happened about a month ago and you know, our child was born somewhere in between there. So it's been kind of a blur and the, the thing about it or the thing about this, the speed of all of this is that it doesn't obviate anything that came before it necessarily, but it, it, it's such a, it's such a, what's the word I'm going for on this one? So it doesn't obviate anything, but it's fundamentally, be it's a, it's a, it's a better option if that's the op if that's the path you want to take, if that makes sense. Yeah. Like it's not like objectively better on, on all these things. So you can't mm -hmm. like, It's just, it depends on what you, what the dynamics are you want to, you want to have as a founder. So if I want to have, you know, a, a certain type of community dynamic, and if I want X and Y and Z, then I would probably choose this. However, if, you know, if, if it's a larger, like multi-year, huge, heavy infrastructure build, like maybe a fair launch, you know, is not the best setup for that. Like right now, you know, those, those long duration, uh, long runway to public launch might not be the best setup for this yet. And so, you know, what I hope to see is that we get out of the, a lot of the conversation early on has been that like, you know, forking a protocol and, and then distributing tokens is a fair launch. Well, that's great, but it also does, it's not the best way to necessarily do that. What we've got to do is evolve these mechanisms so that we can understand what a fair launch can be. And so that founders and teams that want to pursue that can, they know what they, what they have to work with. And right now, none of the, none of the community behaviors and norms have been established. And so, the risks are really high and yeah. So it's kind of like, we don't know what a fair launch can be because it's just the early days. We just know we have hints of what the possibility are. Mm. So at this starting point, what does um, the fair launch plan currently look like? like what, what does it actually um, do? Like what, what are the steps that the, the teams take? Yeah. So right now we, like we, so we just selected the first project that's Marquette and that's with, uh, Simone and Emilio Banasi from, uh, they've been doing, uh, they've been super active in the community for, I'm trying to think of when I first saw their projects, but they've been involved in the synthetics community. They've just mm -hmm. been amazing people. Um, so that's the first project that we ended up selecting and we've been designing, uh, so Stanny from Ave and the team, uh, they've been absurdly helpful. So Stanny and Andre, and Kane, uh, they, they got involved really early and were extremely supportive. And so what we've ended up building out is this custom vault that allows for the project team and we're still designing it right now, but we'll effectively, people will be able to deposit a tokens, any a token and as collateral or as into the vault. And then we'll allow the Marquette team to draw from that. And then they just pay that back over time. So it's basically a credit delegation vault with a few custom levers on it. Um, and that's how we're designing it right now. And that's, you know, so it's, it's a little bit of using some of the infrastructure that exists in the, in the current ecosystem, mm -hmm. working with the teams that are actually pushing the edges of that. So we've got economic designers around us that are just superb um, and that are also involved. And then on the project side, uh, you know, we went through a selection process and Joe and Ruben were great about this, but we had a lot of conversations with um, Emiliano and Simone about how to actually do this and what the risks were, because you know, it's a risk for them to pursue this also. Like, mm -hmm. what if, what if, you know, what if uh, the community doesn't act in their best interest and actually grant them something meaningful? Like, 
So talking through what the risks are for founders, as well as what the risks are just kind of from a project standpoint that can sink this are, that was a big part of this. And so the process right now has been extremely hands-on and also very organic and also really supportive from the community side. The, the people and we've been, we've been talking about since the early days, right? When it was first an idea, I remember talking to you. So we've got, you know, 25, 30 people who are really hands-on and really supportive that we can take things and bounce them off of. And the idea is let's just get this first project right. And if we get this first one right and we figure out some of the behaviors and we create a few economic tools in terms of contracts and vaults and things like that, then we've got, you know, a first template or another template that we can then take that and go forward. But I think where we are right now is we've got a lot of learning ahead of us. And so I'm hoping to see a lot of founders that where this model makes sense, pick up the ball and run with it. And then we get to do some economic design with them on the, on kind of the leading edge of what these, what these models are. Um, okay. So how it works is that uh, investors in, in Fairland Capital will put in this vault um, a, a number of A tokens, right? These are Aves tokens, which mm-hmm. um, earn interest. Like, w- will they be kind of interest uh, yep. gaining tokens? Okay, so they'll, they'll place these A tokens inside of a vault. And this vault will be kind of like a credit line for, for projects. Um, and they'll be able to draw on the funds in, in this vault. Um, how, and how, how does that withdrawal process work? Like, is it, does it depend on um, certain milestones or is it like every, every period of time they're able to withdraw? Yeah, so right now, we're, I think that'll be different for every project. Mm-hmm. So it can be milestone based, it can be time based. And right now we don't have anything set in code yet with them. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think we're gonna see, there'll be variations for different projects. Like I don't think there's gonna be I think the spirit of, of like the, the spirit of a fair launch is what will be uniform, but the recipes of the playbooks for how you go about doing that are what are going to be end up those, those need to be designed. And so, you know, the, the notion of a Daiko and all like the things that shake out of, of all the possibilities have to be, uh, they've got to be tested. They've got to be explored through projects using them. And that's kind of what we're in the middle of doing right now. So, that's also why we kind of capped the experiment right now at just one protocol. Let's see how this one works with mm-hmm. the delegated credit vault and the people involved. And let's just see how, let's see how this first launch goes. Um, and then we can kind of, let's see if we can do more. Right. And then, so on, have you discussed like the terms uh, with which they, they would pay back uh, these funds? Yeah. So the terms are pretty straightforward, right? At least right now, the, it's pretty widespread, but basically pay it back within the first year. And okay. you can pay it back. And, you know, the, the ask is to pay everything back within the first year, but we're asking to possibly pay back maybe double so we can then go do two projects. Mm. Um, that's not a mandate by any means, but it is a request. Um, okay. And then we could basically, we could see if we could go uh, multiply that and do a couple more projects. Mm. And so that's it. Right now we're keeping it, I think, pretty simple just to see if we can, because what we've got to really prove out here are the community behaviors. The, the biggest risk is for founders right now. Um, mm. And will they be compensated? How do we design the compensation mechanisms in for them? And so that's, those are some of the big unknowns is, you know, I don't think that founders should step into a fair launch with the risk over their head of not receiving compensation for mm-hmm. the, the amount of work they've put in. And so I think that's a false dichotomy that kind of exists right now, just because the norms haven't been set. So our job with this one is let's establish a few norms and data points that we can point to how these things work, or hopefully not how it doesn't work. But uh, yeah, you get my yeah. idea. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, that's interesting. So basically, what happens is that the um, interest that in in projects, or at least this project, pays over their loan becomes um, kind of the um, extra capital that the fund gets to to continue uh, funding other projects going forward. Hopefully. And I mean, on top of that though, if let's say, let's say Marquette does exceptionally well and like, it just goes through the roof, you know, maybe, maybe they'd be interested in paying, you know, paying back double so that we could go do another project and it wouldn't be too big of a hit to their treasury to do so. So that's the other side of it. It's like, you know, maybe if it, if the first one is successful, great. Then we've got maybe a little bit more wiggle room. If it's a little bit, uh, if it's a little bit tighter, then we'll just do one and there's no expectation of that. Um, Yeah. And what do the investors in this 
get out of this because if like the, all the money is getting continuously kind of reinvested in other projects, where is the investor exit? Yeah. So right now, nobody is really an investor. It's like the way we've approached this first one is just if you put your money in as, as, as one of the first people funding these grants, and that's kind of why we approached the first, you know, the, that first core group of people of like, okay, let's, let's just say, like, don't expect to get this money back was kind of how we approached it. Mm. It was like, we're going to use this as a pay it forward grant. And if everything goes well, you know, we can pay it forward, but let's just assume you're not going to get this money back. Um, so it's not necessarily as an investment right now. It's, it's more of just, like I said, a no strings attached grant for these projects that they can pay forward or the community can pay forward. Um, mm. On the investment side, you know, the way to get involved is literally to probably get involved. And that's, pro that's, that's where I think that you're going to have a lot of interest and heat in this ecology that starts to bloom if it happens is the way to be, the way to, the way to participate is literally through having your capital ready and in the form it needs to be in order to participate when the network goes live. And so in the case of, in the case of Marquette, um, what you want to have is you want to be a member of the synthetics community and also of the uh, Ave community, right? And so that's, so you can be participating from day zero without necessarily having to change the, the structure of what you have on hand. And so that's where it like, it pays to be hands-on and close to these things and supporting them so that, that way you can, you can be able to move nimbly enough for this project and on day zero, you're ready to go participating with everybody else. So mm. as an investor, you're, you're incentivized to participate. Um, but you, you know, for the people that are effectively funding these first audits, it's not really an investment. It's more just a, you know, it's a grant and let's see if we can catalyze, you know, more of these projects because what, what could happen here, and this is, I would love to see this happen. It's what happens if you have 20 to 30 projects that are the right dynamic for a fair launch and they, you know, a handful of them do exceptionally well, then, well, then you have an ecology that starts to kind of grow of fair launch projects that have a different dynamic, different community makeup, a different, um, yeah, it's just almost a, a lot about them is different than the mm -hmm. traditional venture backed uh, network. And as a result, we're going to see how those dynamics play out in time and, and over the next, you know, 18 months. And that to me is extremely interesting. Mm -hmm. What, what are the slight, what are the, like the things that seem nuanced today that are actually magnified, um, in the next market or, you know, like the things that we don't know that we just kind of assume. Um, and so it's, it's really creating the, the conditions for a lot of live experiments to sit here and grow. Um, and that's what a lot of these first people are who are involved. It's, do they, they're, they want to see this experiment. And so let's create those conditions. And so they're helping us create the conditions. Got it. So, I mean, basically what I think investors will get out of this is just, you know, be close, being close to the, these projects and, and by, by supporting them, if, if these projects do well, uh, then they'll do well too, because they were kind of in from the very, you know, early days and investing in them or not investing in them, but, but just like using the, the, the protocol, providing liquidity or whatever it may be. Um, yeah. so, so, so that's kind of how. I'd augment that with one thing too. It's like the way that, uh, Emiliano and Simone have designed, um, Marquette is that, you know, it's not just, it's like, fair launches need to go beyond liquidity mining really quickly because mm -hmm. like, let's get beyond the first generation, like bootstrapping mechanisms. And so what they're doing with, with, uh, with their launch is it actually uses the native, like it actually adds, it uses synthetics and, and Aave for what they're meant to be used for. So it's a really symbiotic bootstrapping mechanism in order to bootstrap Marquette into existence. It's not really parasitic or it's not parasitic at all when you consider how it's working. And so what, we're, what we need to see are, again, the development of these, of these bootstrapping mechanisms so that, because what it does is it actually makes your investment in, in Aave or synthetics. It supports the, both of those in addition to making this new thing possible. And so as an investor, like I'd be looking for those types of projects, which actually support the, the, like, let's call them like the layer ones, mm -hmm. like the, the foundation level projects that made that possible, right? Synthetics and Ave, mm -hmm. And then you have Marquette on top of that. And so um, understanding both of those dynamics, I think is extremely useful. So it's evolving those bootstrapping mechanisms so that the way that you actually bootstrap your fair launch protocol into existence is 
symbiotic as opposed to, like I said, parasitic. Um, mm. Because, yeah. So would you describe some of the kind of yield farming uh, projects right now as parasitic? I think you've got a lot of noise. Like mm -hmm. I'll, 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 I'll walk carefully on that one, but mm -hmm. yeah. So yes, I would. Mm -hmm. And also I'm, you know, I'm also okay with it. I, it's like, I don't know. I don't believe, like you're going to see everything. And I feel like you almost, in order for people to learn lessons, they have to see what they shouldn't do relative to what they, it's like, you're not going to stop anything in this ecosystem. So mm -hmm. experimentation is, is what is, I think the nature of this place. Mm -hmm. And when you like, I love embracing that and just saying, okay, so if we can do anything, then expect anything. That's where you get like, you know, um, all, all the forks, all the, all the derivations that are slight tweaks and mm -hmm. it ha the, the iteration, the speed, the siphoning of liquidity, all these things happen extremely fast, mm -hmm. but in that speed, we get a lot of learning and you know, the price you pay for a lot of that learning is a whole lot of BS and a whole lot of noise. Mm -hmm. But you know, the upside of that is, Occasionally you get these new primitives and when you're paying attention, you take those things out and you say, ah, that's the diamond in the rough. And now let's like, let's refine this. And so that's, you know, hopefully that's what we're doing with, with fair launch as like a, as an experiment, you know, mm -hmm. is this one of those primitives that we can take and really refine and let that become a tool for a new generation of network creation. Mm. Um, I'm, I'm interested to hear more about how you think um, this this new mechanism can help bootstrap projects and, and move beyond the, this like yield farming way of, of adding liquidity because you know yield farming has been extremely effective in driving short-term liquidity but we've seen you know that there are different degrees of success in, in keeping that liquidity once the rewards run out. So um, what are your thoughts on, on kind of how the space can, can move forward and, and how does Fair Lunch play a part in that? Yeah. So what you're talking, like another way is like, how do you, there's a lot of conversation around like, what is the unforkable thing, right? Mm -hmm. Like, because, you know, if you had asked a lot of people at the beginning of the year, they'd say, oh, it's liquidity and the, the wars around liquidity are going to be a thing. Um, and you watch liquidity, it's, yeah, it's as fickle as anything else. Um, mm -hmm to a certain point. I mean, but you know, all that said, I don't think I have, and I don't think there's necessarily a solid answer because all these, all the things that have staying power and, and have stuck are like complex organisms. And so you could, we could try to like, you know, make a matrix of, of attributes and say, okay, these have a strong community. They have a strong brand. They have economics going for them. Mm -hmm. And I think there's probably some blend of brand and economics and community and, you know, the economic distribution. And, you know, there's, there's probably a set of attributes which are uniform across these things, but I don't think we have like the playbook for what is, for what these all look like necessarily yet. Mm -hmm. But, you know, maybe, maybe another way to approach the answer is what creates the conditions, what create, what might create the best conditions or the most likely conditions for something that is less likely to be so fickle. Mm -hmm. And in that case, it's like, let's assume that most people are profit seeking. That's great. But um, then what are, what are you looking to create? Is it just, is it like in a, in a long-term protocol, can, do people want to stay involved because they believe that's where the profit will be long-term and along the way, are they, are they, are they capable of seeing the upside as that's happening? Mm -hmm. Or is it the case like, let's put it this way. In the case of a lot of the yield farming uh, protocols, the long-term upside and, and longevity of just leaving your money there, it's not, it's, it doesn't exist. And so of course you're going to have money flowing from point A to point B to point C to point D. Whereas if you're building something that has a really strong community dynamic and it's a little bit more, the roadmap and the vision for what it can be and what it's going to become are there, right? Like synthetics did a great job of that, of like, here's what this ecology is going to become. And we've got all these mechanisms to make this a possibility. So you could look at that recipe and say, ah, they've got a strong community distribution and blah. And the thing that Fair Launch kind of adds into that pot of recipes or, or attributes is just a different economic distribution um, at the beginning and a different incentive model and uh, engagement model for the community. Because typically what you have is this ownership that skew uh, heavily in, in favor of whoever the early investors were. I'm not saying that's bad. That's, what, that's one of like the misconceptions of, of a lot of this is like, 
it's, it's saying that that's, you know, that that's somehow wrong or whatever. And that's not the case. This is just saying, this is a different dynamic. And so if, if, uh, if the community is scared off by a large V like a large investor overhang, that's just waiting to hit the market. What this does is this just gives the founder or the, the founding team a different, you know, arrow in their quiver to use when they want to actually go design what they're, what they're wanting to build. And that to me is, that's what it's about. It's like, as we're looking to create things that have long-term staying power and things that have engaged communities, or let's not just engage, but like really functional communities that are capable of making decisions that are good for the protocol and the community in the long term. Like we have yet to see that still in a, in a really big way. And so again, this is this phase in the ecosystem to me feels like we're getting, we're, we're learning what the tools are and how to use them. And so that's, that's kind of what fair launch is just adding is, is a different way of distributing and creating the economics so that you don't have the same overhang and worry on the community side. And that slight tweak in dynamics I think is going to have massive impact. And we've already seen it, I think, a little bit just in terms of the resonance with the idea of fair launches, even though, you know, the term fair launch has been thrown around a lot, like, mm -hmm. like it's been used a lot, right? And so, um, but the, the idea of, of what it can be in terms of uh, equalizing the distribution, um, we have yet to see how that all, how that all works. Right. Um, so it's interesting, I guess, kind of the, the, the main practical result of of applying this new fundraising mechanism is mm, reducing the risk that the token distribution is skewed towards um, a few large holders um, and instead have it be more, I guess, like decentralized or, or more distributed among a larger uh, number of holders. Um, what do you think can be the, the effects of, of having a, a more um decentralized dis distribution of tokens like so like in 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 this space we kind of assume that's that's a good thing but like why exactly is it desirable there's a whole lot of reasons we could i could probably dive into um number one is just the let's just let's say you've got it creating a community is a really hard thing to do like it's just everybody talks about community and it's but it's, there's really people you're either like really hands-on and you love what you're doing and you love the thing or you don't. And it's really apparent when it's either or. And so if you're like creating a community in itself is a hard enough endeavor. And if you're trying to do that with economics that are skewed from the beginning and people, and here's the thing, the market is becoming smarter. And so they're going to, people are more aware of that dynamic. And so when when you're trying to create a community and things are out of balance, you have, you're working up, you're, it's like you're working against two forces. Mm -hmm. But if you can kind of take that, do a little judo with it, use that same momentum and, and do a little, yeah, do something a little bit differently, then what you end up doing is you take one of the hardest problems and you actually make it one of your biggest strengths. And so that's, it's like community is one of the, hard things to fork, I would say, but it's also one of the hard things to define. And so that's what makes it kind of this fuzzy thing in conversation, but it's a very, you know, it's, it's like, it's impossible to miss when you're part of one that is extreme, that is coherent and functioning well. And that's, and so that's like what this sets the conditions for. It's like, it creates the conditions for a healthier community from the beginning that has certain attributes. And so, you know, you might say that you know, really savvy folks actually show up in these things. And the, the investors that actually wanted to be, that are, that are participating in other networks will actually show up and buy into these communities. And so the community formation is, is one side of that, I guess, is the like long of the short. Um, the other, you know, another one for founders is just, I think it's a really powerful thing to be able to, to have the option to bring your idea to market in a very different way. And so rather than going around and having to hop on the road and talk to everybody, if you have a, if you have a way to take care of some of the, some of the upfront costs of audits and you have the ability to build a really coherent community and the way you can actually target, um, we're going to be, I think getting really, we're going to get a lot better with our distribution mechanism. So the ability to target, you know, a certain type of trader or whatever it is, let's just say, I think those tools are going to come along. And so as a founder, um, I'm just able to express myself, uh, much faster and reach the people without as many boundaries. And so that's, that, those are, those are two that I just think are, 
those are really compelling as creators and, and designers. Right. Um, um, yeah. And, and just, you know, speaking of, about founders, um, I just wanted to start kind of um, wrapping up with this kind of important issue of how, how to correctly incentivize um, teams building these projects. I think you've, you've kind of alluded to, to this, um, but I, I think it's been a problem, you know, uh, making sure that incentives are aligned between the users and, and, and the team. And, you know, I think kind of what happened with SushiSwap and the chef Nomi leaving was an example of like how not to do things. Um, how are you thinking about this, this problem? Yeah. Um, through a handful of possibilities, like, I don't know if there's one, if there's one answer to that question. I honestly think it's going to be, it's going to be different for, for different protocols. And I know that sounds like a fuzzy answer, but, um, I think what we need, what we're going to end up with is just best practices. And so best practices and norms, I think like community norms need to be established. We, we don't have any of those. And so, you know, maybe with, with, uh, with this first project that we're doing, one of the first votes that's put forth is actually to grant the team, you know, some meaningful percentage of ownership in the network. Mm -hmm. And so that like right now, that's a risk. So, rather than, you know, saying that it needs to be this, this one mechanism or it's this one way and this is how we do it. What I'm looking, what I'm hoping that we, uh, that we get to and what we're designing for actively are just new norms so that founders can rely on the norms and behaviors. And that way when the norm or the behavior is kind of violated, it, you know, the community can choose to do that. And, but then that's a, that's a sign of, it's probably going to be an anemic community or the, or the, the founders will leave things like that. Like, mm. so that way, when you violate some of those things that actually have created really healthy uh, protocols, ecosystems and communities, it's a sign, it's a red flag. So right now we have no kind of, we have no markers to, to point that out. Like we know that it'd be great to like that when a founding team chooses to do something like this, like, you know, they're, they're, they get some, something up front and they also get these things at these milestones and, I think, it, like I said, there's going to be a lot of recipes for that, but really what, what underlies the creation of those recipes and the creation of those playbooks are just the behaviors and norms. And that's, that's what we need to establish. And um, so that's, I don't think it's one thing. I just think that the, I think, oh, let's put it this way. I think the one thing is the establishing of those norms. Um, and we just don't have that, which is why the fair launch or things that are fair launches are perceived to be higher risk at this point in time, because they are. Um, because we've still got to prove these things out. Um, but you know, let's say 12 months from now, there are, let's say there's 20 founders who have done this, then we've got a new set of norms and then it's much less risky for the next, you know, 20 to go and do something like this. Mm, right. Makes sense. Um, so I guess it's something that we'll start seeing with, with more experience in, in, in this space. Like right now, everything is so, so new that we're, just kind of laying the groundwork of how everything everything works. Um, I, I wanted to kind of touch um, uh, on what IDEO is, is looking at and kind of what in, in interesting trends you're seeing, uh, but we've kind of eaten up the whole hour with uh, Fair Lunch Capital <laughs> uh, because it's obviously so interesting. But, um, you know, still I wanted to just touch on a, a little bit of on that, like what, um, what, what interesting in, uh, things are you looking at, at with IDEO in terms of maybe things that, that you're hoping to see get, get built in, in the next year or, or things that you're looking to invest in right now? Yeah. Um, one thing that we've been, I'll, it, it's kind of a cross cup, like it's, it's, there's a spectrum right now that we're operating on and both things have kind of hit their stride. So I'll start on one end of it, which is we rolled out a, like really quietly, we started DeFi residency uh, middle of this year, like April, I think is when we like kind of started putting things together, um, reached out to some teams and we, the, the feedback. So we've got, you know, the first, like first group of founders going through that. And it's really, it's really great. Like we've got the focus on, uh, on a slew of things from uh, effectively your first liquidity and security and audits. So we've got, uh, you know, the guys from Open Zeppelin and we've got just amazing people kind of 
helping to, to create a program that's focused around the idiosyncrasies and the challenges of building really solid products in DeFi. Mm-hmm. And that's, that spans from like the security and audit side to liquidity, to launching, to, you know, uh, like what happens when there are bugs and prod and things like that. We've got a great group there. And we've got kind of this rolling format. It's flexible. And so we've had teams kind of come in and go through and like, we're just there and we're, we're getting a good sense of what that is. And that's, you know, one of the, the things that we've been really tasked with figuring out as doing IDEO and crypto is how to bring what IDEO is in terms of its design capability to bear in crypto. Mm-hmm. And this program has kind of given us a really tactical hands-on way to do a lot more of that with a lot more teams. And so uh, we've been really hands-on in the DeFi space for a long time. And this has been just a, uh, the latest incarnation of that for us. And so that's been really exciting. We've got a handful of teams in there right now the first team from Fair Launch Capital, um, they're actually joining the residency, so they're part of that now. So like, we're kind of blending a lot of these experiments with like Fair Launch and the residency together. Um, and that's great. And so across the spectrum there, um, you know, between Joe, Ian, and Tara, and myself, we're all really hands-on learners. And so that's just a, that's a really good playground. On the other side of that spectrum, um, this is the first time this year where some of the investments we've made are at stages where it can, we have a really, a global network. So IDEO is one of the world's top design firms. It's got offices around the world. And so we've got access to, and we've got this just really large network of, you know, fortune 500s, as well as like large, just large customers. And a lot of these customers that we've, we've done, you know, R and D work with, or we've just got good connections with, we've been able to connect some of our early stage portfolio companies who are now at that place into that network. And so that was kind of one of the other sides of why do something at IDEO is how do you bring that network to bear here when it's ready? And so we're just starting to get into that, into that kind of interface between those things. And that's been really great. So those are two different areas um, kind of, or two different points on the, on the scale, but where we're, we've been really uh, getting a lot of heat, but in terms of, you know, I'll speak personally where a lot of our excitement is, is mm-hmm. on some of these early stage experiments. I know we've been experimenting a lot with uh, personal tokens. Um, I know Ian's been writing a lot about those. So between that, kind of that space and a lot of the DeFi stuff, we've got a lot of really great experiments that are going on. And uh, yeah, so that's, that's, that's where my excitement lies. So, you know, what I'm really hoping, and also another personal thing is like, what I'm hoping that we can do is if, if we can create the conditions for the next 50 fair launch projects, boy, then like, that's something that I think we as, we as the, as the, as a group would like to like help make possible. Um, because again, you get this new possibility of an ecosystem with different dynamics. And so that's one thing we're, we're really well set up to experiment, even to the point of interrupting our own business model. And so that's, Mm -hmm. that's what we're doing. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. It's so interesting that you're creating this new way of fundraising, but you're also kind of VCs yourself or, um, yeah. at least like part of your businesses. So it, it's, it's really interesting. Uh, but it, it looks like you're finding a way to kind of make two, the two sides coexist. Um, awesome. And I agree, like the personal token space blending with DeFi is absolutely fascinating. Oh. <laughs> the experiments that are happening right now are, yeah, yeah this, it's one of the, it's the, you know, it's, this is some of the most fun I've had in just years. The, yeah. The people and the projects, it, yeah, the, the a lot of things are just really great at this point in time. And so, yeah, it's a nice it's a nice time to be active in the space again. Yeah, no, I agree. Absolutely. All right, I, we need to start wrapping up, but um, it's been amazing chatting, Gavin. Thank you so much for, again, for joining me in the middle of this crazy time and so special time in, in your life with a new baby. So congrats on that again. And thanks, thanks again. It's been such an amazing conversation. Thanks, Cammy. Likewise, great talking to you. 